What you see here is just a very small sampling of what is available on Covenant Media Foundation. They have thousands of hours worth of lectures, seminars, and so forth from a multitude of people, to include Greg Bonson, on a multitude of topics, ethics, philosophy, theology, apologetics, you name it. Check them out at covenantmediafoundationnow.org, cmfnow.org. Is your God sadistic or is he impotent? Which is it? Okay, now, Christian, you choose. Which of those alternatives do you take? Is your God sadistic? He's all-powerful, and he's making all these things happen. Or is your God impotent? He really grieves for it like you do, but he just can't do anything about it. Is he without power, or is he without goodness? Is he sadistic or impotent? Okay, now, at this point, having introduced the problem, and I hope made you serious about it, and at least given you roughly the outlines of its logical difficulty, let's start talking about some of the alternatives that are possible. What are some of the ways in which we might try to resolve this problem of evil as Christians? I'm going to offer nine or ten of them to you in rapid succession, and then I'd like to get on to an illustration of the presuppositional method in apologetics, not only as a way of showing that this school of thought's a good one, that's important enough, I suppose, but more importantly, to show that we do, in fact, have a good and all-powerful God, one who should be trusted. All right, there are those who say, well, we as Christians look upon this evil that we've seen in the world as ultimately unreal. It appears evil right now, but ultimately it's not real. Not a very adequate solution. In fact, it, it commits one of the most heinous crimes according to the Bible because it really ends up saying that evil is good. Calling evil good and good evil is, is considered the very essence of sin in fact in the Bible. And here we have an apologetical approach, not a popular one in evangelical circles, but it has been used historically to say, well, evil is not metaphysically real. It's not uh, it, it, it's only an illusion. But of course, if evil is only an illusion, then it doesn't make any sense to talk about values at all. I mean, because it seems fundamental to any value system that there's a difference between good and evil. But if there is no evil, then there's no difference between good and evil, and there's no sense to talk about values. And so, I mean, we're really throwing the baby out with the bathwater if we take that approach. Well, then somebody else says, well, it's not that evil is not real. It's that evil is really good in disguise. This is very similar to the first option. The first one was evil doesn't really exist. The next option is, well, evil could exist, but all the forms of evil we've talked about are illusions. They really are good in disguise. Now, that's a hard one to follow for most people who aren't philosophically oriented. It's not very interesting. But let me give you a little bit better form of something that's similar to that, and you start to get the point. Somebody says, well, evil is really a means to the good. Evil is, you will, a disguise for the good in that evil always works out for the good. Evil is always a means to the good. And here's where Romans 8.28 comes in. All things work together for good, right? So even the sufferings of that little child in that outhouse will work together for good. And in that sense, it was only a disguise for good. Or if you will, it was only a springboard for God to accomplish his better ends. What's the problem with saying that evil is a means to the good? Well, in the first place, one would want to ask, is God limited to those means? Couldn't he have used other means? Wouldn't there have been a, couldn't there have been a good springboard to a good end rather than an evil springboard to a good end? I mean, even if evil works out for the good of God's plan eventually, why was there evil to begin with? By the way, in this context, uh, if good does contribute, uh, I'm sorry, if evil does contribute to the ultimate good, how can one be sure that good itself doesn't contribute to an ultimate evil? I mean, you see, the unbeliever can reverse the tables on you when you start playing that little game of something is disguised as something else. That looks evil, but it's really good if you just wait around. And somebody says, yeah, well, all those good things you're talking about your God does, they look good, but man, he's going to zap you in the end. So... You better watch out when you use these two-edged swords. They cut, you know, both of us. Moreover, if evil is really only a means to the good, then we don't really have an obligation to remove it, do we? 
I mean, if evil is there to serve the, the good ends of God, who would we be to thwart the good ends of God? By all means, let the people, you know, rape and pillage and, and carry on. No, this is not an adequate solution. So let's go to another one. Somebody says, well, evil is really a necessary counterpart to good. Okay? Have you ever looked at a, a mosaic? Okay? If you get a close to the mosaic and you just look at the individual pieces, then nothing seems to make much sense. It all seems so chaotic and random and all that. But if you back up, all of a sudden things fit into the pattern. What may seem like red out of place in the mosaic, you back up and you see the red set over against the contrast of the blues or the yellows or what have you, makes the picture. And so evil is a necessary counterpart to good. Moreover, how, um, how would one even know what evil is? I mean, how would one know what good is without evil to begin with? I mean, do you, do you know what health is without disease? Do you know what happiness is without sadness? Well, I think this approach to the problem, again, makes God evil by necessity. For you see, if evil is the necessary counterpart to good, and God is good, then that means there must be another supernatural being, necessarily, who is the counterpart to that, an evil one. Moreover, if evil is necessary to good, then God's creative ability has been limited, because it says God can't create a good world without simultaneously creating something evil in the world. And so we don't have an omnipotent God after all. This seems to challenge the all-powerfulness of God. There are those who tell us now to follow another approach, that evil is there to enhance our appreciation of the good. It may not be necessary, but it does enhance our appreciation of the good. Well, the question is, does God appreciate good for all that it is? Well, if evil is necessary to enhance appreciation of the good, then God must experience evil, undergo evil, or be evil in order for an all-knowing God to perfectly appreciate the good. And that again attacks one of the premises. That says that God is not perfectly good. He is good to a certain extent, but then has some evil too. Well, all these approaches um, that I've been using thus far would probably not be tempting to anybody in this room. I I'm assuming so. You, you would not have been inclined to, to take that approach to the problem of evil if an unbelieving relative or friend had posed it to you. But they are important historically. They have been raised, and we do need to dismiss them by saying at least as much as we have. Let's go on to a more popular option. This is one that you hear over and over and over in the evangelical world. Evil came from Satan. All right. What's the next question? How did Satan become evil if God is all-powerful? You see, for the approach that says evil came from Satan to be a valid one, you must believe in an ultimate dualism. You must believe, you see, that there is an all-powerful good God and an all-powerful evil God, Satan. And Satan is the source of the evil, God's the source of the good. But that kind of dualism is totally contrary to the biblical portrayal of God. If it were true that Satan is the ultimate source of evil, then God is not omnipotent. And by the way, if there is an ultimate malevolent deity, that is an ultimate uh, all-powerful bad demon, then our redemption is certainly in question, isn't it? Who knows whether God will be powerful enough to redeem his people in the end. You see, once you start talking about trying to shift the blame to Satan and forgetting the omnipotence of God, everything gets out of whack in Christian theology. Well, let's try another approach that I've heard in sermons, even in some of the best churches. Evil is permitted as God's warning against sin and as God's punishment for sin. Sin is its own punishment, which is true, by the way, but I'm talking about that premise being used in this context. God warns us by showing us the evil of our sin, what comes from our sin, and God punishes us when we do sin. Well, is that supposed to be God's way of turning men to himself to make innocent children suffer in that outhouse? I mean, is the unbeliever supposed to be impressed that God used such as, used, uses such a means to bring men to himself? It seems, it seems, I think, it seems to me, a most ineffective way for God to turn men to himself. 